In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Gospel of today's Mass gives us an image of St. John the Baptist. He appears frequently in this season of Advent since he is the greatest of all of the prophets of the Old Testament. He is the culmination of the law and the prophets. Every major event in in the sacred history of the Old Testament points to our Lord Jesus Christ. And every major sacred figure in the Old Testament was in some way a prefiguration, that is a foreshadowing of Christ in the New Testament. This great work of preparation and expectation of the Messiah, the work of pointing him out as the true Messiah, which was the sole function of the Old Testament and of Judaism in general, this great work fell upon St. John the Baptist in an extraordinary manner. When Christ appears, St. John will literally point the finger at him as if on a stage before the whole world. And with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with Moses, Aaron, and Joshua, with the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and all the prophets, with King David and with the Holy Maccabees, he will say with strength and authority, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sin of the world. And with those words and the pointing out of the true Messiah, Christ, the work of the whole Old Testament of all of those prophets, of all of the kings, of all of the great patriarchs of the lawgiver Moses, all of that work will be finished. From our Lord's own comments about St. John the Baptist, we know what qualities this saint has. Has. In the first place, <clears throat> our Lord says, He is not a reed shaken by the wind. By this, our Lord means that St. John is incapable of being swayed by any worldly consideration. He cannot be corrupted by the opinion of men, either by their scorn or by their honors. He is not even tempted by the thought of presenting himself as the Messiah, as some thought he was. Nor is he tempted to relent, even at the point of accepting death, on his condemnation of the vices of Herod. The second quality of St. John, from God's own mouth, is that he is not dressed in soft garments. John's family was not poor, and he could have lived a comfortable comfortable life. But out of a sense of duty to his sacred vocation, he abandoned all of the comforts of his home, and at an early age, some say five years old, went out into the desert where he ate virtually nothing, only locusts and honey, and where he wore the skins of animals. In order to manifest in the most extreme way possible the necessity of penance and mortification. The third quality described by our Lord is that St. John is more an angel than a prophet. Now a prophet is a man to whom is given the revelation of God 
in order that it be communicated to other men. Thus we think of the prophet Isaiah or the prophet Ezekiel. But an angel is a messenger from heaven, like the angel Gabriel, with a message from God. The very word angel derives from the Greek word which means messenger. An angel, furthermore, is a pure spirit. Our Lord praises St. John in this way because of the depth of St. John's faith, his extraordinary purity of life, and his love of God. He is more an angel than a prophet. Like angels, he neither eats nor drinks except what, for what is absolutely necessary for sustenance, because he is a man, after all. And like angels, he is not married, and he possesses nothing, Like angels, he constantly beholds the face of God. He thinks of nothing else but God. St. John's life, therefore, is a summary, we might say, of our Lord's Gospel. What we admire in every saint can be found to an extraordinary degree in St. John the Baptist. If we admire For example, the mortification that saints do. Who is more mortified than St. John the Baptist? Or if we admire their chastity, who is more chaste than St. John the Baptist? And if we admire their devotion to God, well, who is more devoted to God than St. John the Baptist? If we admire their martyrdom, who is more the martyr than St. John the Baptist? And we should here learn some lessons for our own spiritual lives. In the first place, we know from our Lord's own words that St. John is one of the most intimate friends of God. He did not praise his apostles with words that he used concerning St. John the Baptist. Yet we see that God prepared a life of suffering, of ignominy, and mortification for this beloved saint, only to crown it by imprisonment and finally death by decapitation. That is the life that God prepared for this beloved saint. After the imprisonment of St. John, it would seem that God abandoned him. St. John the Baptist, unlike St. Peter, is not let out of prison by an angel nor is the acts of the executioner stayed, as in the case of many martyrs in the Colosseum. No, this great saint, of whom our Lord says, Amen, I say to you, there is not risen among them that are born of women a greater than John the Baptist. This great saint is permitted by God to lie wretched in a prison abandoned and to meet his death in a most unjust manner that is at the command of a godless worldling Herod who has promised to appease a dancing girl St. John's life should therefore be a lesson and a consolation to those who feel the burden of the Holy Cross or who are troubled by the apparent victory of the worldly. We should also learn lessons for our own spiritual lives from the comments of our Lord concerning St. John the Baptist. It is 
as if our Lord is giving us a preview of St. John's judgment. When he makes these comments about St. John, it is as if he is pronouncing St. John's judgment. And we can see what virtues catch the eye of God, if we may use that term. In the first place, he is not a reed shaken by the wind, and so we should not be reeds shaken by the wind. And we should not take into consideration what the world thinks of us, but only what God thinks of us. The only thing that matters is what God thinks. What human beings think do not, does not matter. But many people are slaves of what human, pe- human beings think. They cower at the scorn of their relatives and they make compromises of the faith in order to please their pagan relatives or ambitious to have the approval of the world they are willing to conform to any wicked standard in order to be well seen Rather, we must be like the solid oak tree planted deeply in the faith and in the love of God. And like St. John, ignore both the threats and the enticements of this world. Secondly, let us not be dressed in soft garments. By this image... Our Lord is praising St. John for his courageous detachment from the delights of this world. How much the world today is in need of detachment. More than ever, we are subject to the temptation to lead a soft life, even one of easy prosperity with riches at our fingertips. But no matter how much today we should complain about money or how little of it we have, everyone knows that we are living in a time of unprecedented prosperity and that we can put our hands on things, riches, delights, that our ancestors could never have even thought of. We are satiated in these things. And to be dressed in soft garments is to love excessively, that is, beyond our legitimate needs, according to our state in life, the things of this world. And so let us imitate St. John, who despised the world, the love of the world will lead us always to act in a worldly way. It will lead us always to please the world because love directs all things toward the beloved. That is a general principle of love. Love directs all things toward the beloved. And if we love the world, He who loves the world will not act justly even though in his heart he knows what is right. Because love directs all things toward the beloved. So if you love the world, you will abandon what you know to be right in your heart because you love the world. And I'll give you some examples. Herod knew that St. John was a just man. And it says in the Gospel that he hesitated. He was grieved by the idea of having to chop his head off. He knew he was a just man. But he had to behead him 
because he had lust for Salome. And his whole being was directed toward that lust. And even though he knew in his heart that it was wrong to behead him, he did it anyway. Pilate knew that our Lord was just, but he had to crucify him because he feared the loss of the esteem of the emperor. Henry VIII knew that St. Thomas More was a just man and that he was right, but he had to cut his head off because he had lust for Anne Boleyn. Likewise, when we sin, we know what is right, but we sin anyway. We are drawn to sin because our love directs us there. If, like St. John, we do not love the world, then we will not be directed there in time of temptation. And, thirdly, let us be like angels. The angels pray constantly. They look at God constantly. Like angels, let our lives be dominated by prayer. Pray often. Offer up your works, your good works during the day to God. To be angelic is to have the purity of an angel. And this purity is acquired by making our souls dominate over our bodies and not vice versa. Someone is impure when he lets himself go to the filth of acting like an animal, a material brute, as if he is possessed, as if he possessed no mortal, no immortal soul. But to be angelic is to be spiritual, and to be spiritual is to be prayerful. St. John's life was one of constant prayer, constant meditation on the things of God, and we should strive to imitate this attention of St. John the Baptist on the things of God. Imagine if you were in a courtroom on trial for your life, your attention would be entirely on the outcome of that trial, which could mean your execution. And you would think about nothing else but the outcome of that trial. If you were crossing a rickety bridge over a raging river, you would think about nothing else during that time but the hope of achieving the other side. And every step on the bridge would be taken most carefully and with an act of hope. And if two men were fighting with swords to the, to the death, neither would think about anything else except how to be victorious over the other. And so our spiritual lives should draw us to an intense attention to God to the laws of God to the goodness of God to the rights of God and to the justice of God we should fix our attention on the salvation of souls which is the will of God primarily our own soul our sanctification it is this quality this attention this intensity which made St. John the Baptist like an angel from heaven. So as God in his holy incarnation has taken on flesh to be more like us, in return, prepare yourselves for Christmas by being more spiritual in order to be more like him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.